You know, I think I think one of the Jungian concepts we're dancing around here is this notion that uh, Jung called the relativization of the ego. That basically means that we have an experience that lets us know that our ego is only a tiny part of us. So it's often in relationship to the self. We can have this relativization of the ego in many ways. We can have it just because we have a big ego plan that fails. And it's like, oh, I guess not everything, you know, I can't always have my way. But I think that one of the signs that the ego has been properly relativized is that somebody has access to reverence. You know, for most people that have a near-death experience, too, it's incredibly, like, blissful. It's, you know, realer than real, and it's so, uh, you know, they, they see things. They, some some near-death experiences uh, have been reported among those people who have been blind from birth. Mm-hmm. And then they, they suddenly have vision and can see things. And so, so they're rapturous, many of them, although there, there is... There is a there are small numbers of reports of people having really unpleasant near death experiences. I imagine that those are talked about less, but they are out there. But but I think it, it so it's not only it's it's you know a lot of people report and we'll see this in Jung's report too. It's like you know it's, they're told we hear this story of you're told it's not time you have to go back and often there's a sense of like no mm. I don't want to go back yeah don't make me go back and that happened to Jung. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had a near-death experience, and he was very angry at his doctor for for bringing him back. Uh, he really protested uh, having to return. You know, I think I think one of the Jungian concepts we're dancing around here is this notion that uh, Jung called the relativization of the ego, and it, it's it's a sort of a big term that basically means that we have an experience that lets us know that our ego is only a tiny part of us. Mm -hmm. So it's often in relationship to the self. But, uh, you know, and we can have this relativization of the ego in many ways. We can have it just because we have a big ego plan that fails. Mm -hmm. And that's like, oh, I guess not everything, you know, I can't always have my way. But Something like this is uh, kind of next level. It, it's, it's a real, you know, Jung said that it's the approach to the numinous that heals. And a lot of these NDs yes. are incredibly numinous. Yes. And, and so it would be that experience of coming back and really knowing in a very visceral way that your ego is not all there is. Mm-hmm. Uh. Let's just go back and say for listeners what you mean by the self, which is what Jung called that transpersonal, transcendent uh, reality that is uh, often imaged in religions as uh, a divine figure, the the Buddha, uh, the Christ, uh, various other kinds of images, so that we have a way of envisioning it. But uh, it is that which is not I. And because this is archetypal, uh, it has a dark side as well as a light side. Mm -hmm. So when you said, Lisa, that sometimes there are experiences that are really uh, difficult for people, um, that that too is part of the self. uh, And we're called upon in life, not only uh, through near-death experiences, to encounter that. Yeah, that's great framing, Deb. I, I think, you know, if you read some of these negative, uh, these negative reports, or even if yeah. you look at, you know, some people have negative experiences with psilocybin or other psychedelics. Exactly. It's like, oh yeah, there's the dark side of the self, right? It's, yeah, it's going, it's going to kind of pick you up and chew you up and spit you out. Uh, and so those experiences, I mean, we are called upon to be able to stand against that, to be able to hold on to a sense of self mm. uh, in, in the face of something that is greater, which is, you know, in a way, exactly what happened to Job. Yeah. When he finally, you know, goes out and says, you know, all these things have happened to me, and he demands of Yahweh, you know, sort of, in effect, demanding an explanation. I was a good person, and I did everything I was supposed to do, and what is all this about? And uh, the answer basically, uh, you know, the words are, 
you know, where were you when I created the, mm-hmm. the heavens and the earth? I'm paraphrasing. But uh, that it is simply the recognition of something greater yeah. that um, in that moment appears in its dark and uncaring aspect. And Job has enough integrity as a personality, as a human, uh, to, be a- to be able to stand in that and stand against it and not be swept away by it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's really important, is what do we do as individuals in the face of something greater? And it's wonderful when it's benign and magical and sweeps us away, you know, and I'm thinking about, um, you know, our podcast and what's out there in the culture with um, mind-altering substances. But uh, in the meantime, we have our lives to live making us have enough wholeness, enough integrity, enough sense of self to have that while we are having other experiences, Mm -hmm. including near-death experiences. And I think that one of the signs that the ego has been properly relativized is that somebody has access to reverence. (laughs) Oh, Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, that's great. Ex- that that feels so spot on. Thank you for that. Yeah, because you it, it, it's Joseph. I I'm so glad you said that because there are people who lack that, and I I can feel how um, irreverent. <laughs> yeah, but but just that that that, that there's a kind of psycho spiritual sickness that goes yeah. along with that inability to feel reverence and awe. Yeah. You know, yes, mm-hmm. it's like those are those are some of the most important things to be able to feel. So, yeah. so thank you for that. Yeah. And that is what Job experienced also. So light or dark, reverence is important. And of course, um, the prereq, so to speak, is developing um, a, a strong, flexible, well-adapted ego that is able to remain present for the other, for these experiences. So I think we're leaning into that question of how might these experiences change someone? Mm-hmm. And so as you were saying, Lisa, that the theology or doxology that they have inherited from the religions of their childhood don't include enough of their experiential dimensions. And so then they begin to seek but also self-define these inner spiritual worlds and, in a sense, create their own paradigm around that, which goes to something that Jung wrote about in terms of what is religion Mm -hmm. and and how can we understand religious organizations. Often what occurs is that an extraordinary person, which in the Catholic tradition we might call a saint, has a profound internal spiritual experience, and then is able to communicate that to others in such a compelling way that they too seek, often through um, imitation, a way to cultivate a similar experience. Mm -hmm. So even though it may seem strange to say that somebody has a near-death experience and in a way Mm. they have formed or are forming their own religion yeah, yeah. around mm-hmm. that, that that actually is how religion in terms right. of technique and theology, in fact, has already occurred. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. Y- you know, there's this stuff about after effects is, is really uh, quite interesting. But w- one of the things, Joseph, that I think relates to what you're talking about is how people are responded to when they first confide. So if the first confiding experience is, oh, that's crazy, or what's wrong with you, or even, oh my gosh, that's evil, because it doesn't match with maybe your religious beliefs or something, it can be very difficult for the person to integrate the experience. But if the first confiding is met with, you know, interest and curiosity and kind of affirming, you know, uh, then... Then, then the person has an easier time integrating yeah. it. But just, uh, you know, just as you're saying, I think 
it, you know, there's this thing that sort of shatters your understanding of what might be, and then you have to come back and make sense of it. And I imagine uh-huh. that you're, you're absolutely right. My guess is that um, people who have experienced NDEs throughout history have come back and made sense of it by uh, kind of re- either knitting it into an existing theology or even creating a new theology uh-huh. because we have to have a way of trying to understand this. Uh, you know, I just want to say I was talking about the common elements. I knew I forgot something. Life review is a common element. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm back on, you know, your concept of the relativization of the ego, of uh, that we do need to make meaning out of it. And yet these experiences will never fit into the narrow confines of our embodied uh, day-to-day uh, experience of uh, ego is just too small mm-hmm. to really be able to render this. So we tell, there are stories. People tell what they experience. Um, there are stories in religious texts of transcendent experiences that may not be near-death experience, but, you know, something like Moses and his vision of the burning bush on the mountain. Um, you know, was it it certainly was not a literal burning bush. Uh, and, and so there are so many experiences that are beyond ego, beyond our ability to really confine uh, in terms of our sensory experience or in terms of, of quote, science, unquote. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't, it, there's no chemical formula for this. And as you were saying, the struggle to find a way to embody, to language, to imagine the experience is necessary for the ego to be able to metabolize it. Mm -hmm. This is the same struggle we have with remembering our dreams, Mm -hmm. that we have some kind of non-ordinary experience in a dream state, Mm -hmm. and if we can't find language to contain it or to bridge our ego experience to the extraordinary experience, it's more likely that we will oh. forget it, that it yeah, will, it will yeah. slip out of our hands. Mm-hmm. So sometimes people that have had near-death experiences do launch on a campaign to find language. Does Tibetan mm-hmm. Buddhism talk about this? Do the ancient Greeks talk about it? Is there something in the mystical dimension of mm-hmm. uh, Catholicism or, or Islam that can give me poetry, language, images to try mm-hmm. to hold on? Yeah. To the experience, because that holding on allows it to become part of the structure of the personality. Mm-hmm. Gives you a way to think about it. Yeah. I, but I really like uh, what you said, Joseph, of non ordinary experience as an umbrella term for near death experience, out of body experience, and dreams. That everybody has dreams. And they are non-ordinary experiences. And there are lots of experiences uh, that religious figures have reported. Um, uh, Muhammad uh, received uh, the the Quran uh, from an angel and uh, had it written down word for word. So there there are so many non-ordinary kinds of experience that we do translate into language, a religious text, or relating the experience, uh, capturing some uh, aspect of the experience in ritual, uh, so, so as to make it more accessible to the conscious mind and, and to others. Mm-hmm.